Hi, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be here. Separated by distance and quarantined by the pandemic, we shared the first stage of a journey that will be with us for a long time, the one into the meanings of the word sustainability. My name is Alice Claire Ranieri, and I'm here together with Fabio Butturi, editor in chief of Diesel International Magazine. Thanks, Alice, and welcome everybody to the first edition of the Sustainable Power Train Tour. First and foremost, we'd like to remind you that today is Earth Day. What better time to emphasize the importance of preserving the sea? So, who and why? Just to fit the journalistic closes to this event, Disney International is focused on power time. So now you're aware about who, why. So it seemed to us that the time has come to rethink what sustainability really meant. So it's time for some kind of disambiguation about this tricky word. And now let's start with a short video to introduce our first special guest, Mr. Robert Van Toll from Water Revolution Foundation, interviewed by our colleague Fabrizio Dallinogare. Welcome everybody. Today we are going to talk about how to promote and increase sustainability in the yachting sector. And we would like to start by involving a young international organization, the Water Revolution Foundation. They truly believe it's possible to preserve the sea and the oceans by starting a revolution from the deck of a super yacht. It's a great pleasure to be uh, here, although digitally. Um, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, Water Revolution Foundation started from within the super yacht industry. Um, the group of founders wanted to develop a collaborative platform that brings together the companies and professionals to drive sustainability in the yachting sector. Um, Like-minded companies that uh, fully support the mission of the foundation and uh, support this as a collective action and want to collaborate in order to achieve the goals. Um, the goals are then to reduce significantly the uh, environmental impact of the yachting sector, but also to look after the, the very precious oceans that we enjoy as yachting sector and reinvest in those for their well-being. In 2021, you're supposed to launch the Ocean Literacy Educational Program. Uh, what is it about and which are the players involved? Thank you. Uh, it's indeed under development. I cannot share too many details yet, but uh, ocean literacy is part of the program. Uh, the program will be called Ocean Assist. And um, what is important to understand is that the oceans are not just here uh, to be taken for granted and in providing in, in uh, what humanity, whatever it needs. So keeping it focused on the, on the yachting sector though, um, Yachting is enjoying the, the oceans. The lifestyle is all about being on the water uh, and enjoying this, this, this beautiful uh, surroundings. So we also need to take care of it. We directly depend on the health of the oceans, uh, perhaps as yachting even more than other maritime sectors where they use it as infrastructure uh, to go from A to B. But for yachting, the ocean is the destination. So in that way, we need to uh, recognize them as a major stakeholder of our business and look after them and invest in them uh, and be real stewards in that way. So yeah, yachting can be at the forefront of uh, sustainable ocean use, as that's called. Um, that's not only protecting uh, areas, but it's, it's looking for and pushing for um, human activity and in balance with the needs of the oceans and marine life. So it can thrive and go hand in hand. That's the ultimate um, goal there to, to accomplish sustainable ocean use. Do you think it's necessary to go beyond the current international emission standards to be really effective from an environmental point of view? In other words, would it be too late without a direct and proactive involvement by shipyards and suppliers? Yeah, then, then that raises the question that 
if you are compliant with legislation, if that makes you sustainable. Our opinion is that if you comply with legislation, you, you are just compliant. So um, legislation can help to, to enforce a certain goal, uh, but in order to get there, it's, it should be really up to an industry to, to define how to get there. So don't compromise on the goal, but develop an own program um, to, to achieve that goal or, or even beyond and make it and turn it into actually uh, um, your new business model and in that way uh, a sustainable business model for the future. According to Cambridge Dictionary, the noun sustainability from the Latin verb sustinere means the quality of being able to continue over a period of time and regarding to the ecological impact the quality of causing little or no damage to the environment and therefore able to continue for a long time. So why restrict oneself to the first most generic definition as the mainstream media does? You know, one word, multiple meanings. Yes, it is our day, isn't it? We mentioned it. We are, so we started this journey from the primordial element, water. So in compliance with Darwinian evolution of the species, we focus on hybridization as a cost-effective technology so is, that's immediately available and it can be implemented starting from today because the real key word of sustainability is right now. And redundancy is important to any boat, and even partial electrification can be a headache. Icomia will present the subject with a broad perspective. Following that, Amr Yacht and Pincantieri Yacht will tell, talk about their vision. Following both of these, a roundtable discussion with Rolls Royce um, power system, Nami Energy in Blue, uh, can't be here, Mr. Passani. Uh, yes, not here unfortunately. Today. And AS Labruna will take place. A suggestion for the audience you may submit your question to the following address events at barrioattorno.com. We'll do our best to deliver the responses at the end of the event and to your email address. And I'll give you uh, the floor to Udo. Kleinitz and Richard Payne from Iconia. Please, Mr. Kleinitz. Thank you very much for the introduction. If we just move to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. You'll see on this slide in the bold letters at the top an abbreviation, and my apologies, we haven't deciphered that. PWC doesn't refer to Price Waters Coopers, but to personal watercraft. So um, it's just one of the elements in our vocabulary. But let me just go into detail there now. ICOMIA is the global umbrella organization for the marine leisure industry. We have full members who are 37 marine industry associations um, who represent the interests of the industry at national level. This covers a broad range uh, activities such as advocacy, giving advice to members um, and industry standards down to holding consumer boat shows. ICOMIA provides a forum for members to exchange information, to promote the harmonization of regulations and to represent the industry at selected European and United Nations stakeholder groups, such as the International Maritime Organization. We are also issuing annual statistics for the sector. These are produced for decades now and an essential source to gain an understanding of the state of the industry, our production capacity, as well as indicative of global boat distribution. Our work, of course, is organized in a number of groups and committees, which include dedicated environmental, sustainability, and substance-related discussions and outputs such as a climate change declaration ICOMA is due to publish within the coming weeks. Relevant for today's discussion is our Marine Engine Committee or IMEC. If we move to the next slide, please. IMEC is an association in its own right managed by ICOMIA. Its members are 16 leading engine manufacturers, be it for outboard engines, inboard applications, 
as well as the already mentioned personal watercraft. The scope of IMEX activity covers regulations for engine exhaust and sound emissions, substances and statistics for outboard engines and PWCs. In order to be fully representative of the marine leisure engine sector, IMEC collaborates with Euromod, another association on matters concerning compression ignition engines. One of our IMEC members will now deliver the technical element of our contribution, and it's my honor to hand over to Richard Payne. Richard works with engine manufacturing company Cummins and holds various roles in Euromod and IMEC working groups. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, Udo. So I'll, you've introduced me very well, so I'll get straight into it. So the recreational craft sector clearly needs to decarbonize along with all the other sectors, especially since it's basically a leisure activity, though it does of course support a large manufacturing and service industry, some of whom are represented here. What I would like to say though, is that it's really important that a full life cycle analysis is carried out for all the potential technologies to decarbonize recreational craft. This is particularly important due to the very low hours of use, especially of the propulsion system. Uh, we think 30 to 50 hours a year is common, sometimes it's even less. So it does make the resource uh, usage and CO2 contribution of manufacturing and recycling, again, the materials used in the craft, a greater proportion of the total than other sectors, where perhaps the operating phase is uh, the, the greatest contribution. So bearing that in mind, it may not make sense to use rare earth magnets and electric motors and cobalt and lithium ion batteries for vessels if the environmental cost of the manufacture and recycling of these items is actually greater than the savings meant made over the life of the craft compared to using liquid fuel energy storage. So with that in mind, although there will be a lot of demand for low carbon and renewable drop-in fuels, um, power to X fuels or biofuels from sectors like aviation, it actually may make environmental sense to allow some recreational craft to have access to these fuels to decarbonize. The mission profile of high-speed recreational craft, particularly those that also carry substantial accom accommodation, does require a great deal of energy to be stored on board. And uh, whilst it may be necessary to somewhat change the customer expectation of this mission profile, for example, with speed reduction or range reduction. It's also uh, necessary to keep these craft attractive to the customers. And that means minimizing additional weight and space used by the propulsion system. In addition, every extra kilogram of weight that goes into the vessel will use extra energy. And it is a diminishing turn, re return to try to increase performance with additional energy storage, particularly batteries, if the weight is not used, where the weight is not used up during the mission. At the end of the day, there's nothing to beat the internal combustion engine and a tank of diesel or petrol in the smaller vessels for energy density and reliable performance. However, having said all that, there will be mission profiles where the new technologies do make sense, even under a life cycle analysis. Uh, for example, full electric operation would be attractive for short range displacement craft, such as river craft or auxiliary engines in sailing cruisers. The, the uh, prerequisite for this, of course, is the necessary charging infrastructure to be provided at the marinas where these vessels stay. Fuel cells may have some potential, especially in fact, for providing the auxiliary power but the fueling and storage of high purity hydrogen is definitely a challenge. For other applications, particularly where a proportion of emission needs to be zero tailpipe emissions to meet local requirements, a hybrid system with a combination of a combustion engine and a battery may well make sense. Such a system would also allow the combustion engine to generally operate at higher loads and less time and therefore be more efficient. And if, in fact, the electrical propulsion could make a significant contribution to the power, for example, to boost the vessel over the hump, as, as the planing vessel gets over the hump, then you might be able to go further, use a smaller combustion engine, which would further increase efficiency. 
But these designs are not without their challenges. One of the challenges with a hybrid, and even more so actually with a full battery system, is that it's really very duty cycle dependent. And the design of a system, the size of a battery, needs to be optimized to the particular customer operational profile to make best use of the battery without adding unnecessary weight to the vessel and using undue resources to manufacture and recycle that battery. With a hybrid system, there's potential to use the combustion engine to charge the batteries, but actually you'll get a greater environmental benefit if they can also be charged when the vessel is in the marina, similar to the battery only vessels. Another one of the challenges is that high powered electric and hybrid vessels will need to run at higher voltages to minimize weight and loss. Currently, anything over 48 volt DC, which carries a significant risk of elect electrocution, um, is not, there, there are not codes and standards for these. And so to encourage manufacturers to build vessels with these higher voltages, it will be necessary to develop codes and standards and preferably get these harmonized to the EU recreational craft directive. Uh, for example, Porsche are now, have now gone to 800 volts in their top spec electric vehicles to get the best performance and efficiency. So really a very quick overview there, but I hope it's helpful to people and, and sets us up for the day. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Mr. Payne. Thanks Mr. Klein. It's say thanks to ICOM, yeah, because you help us to have a big picture of the problem. And now it's time for us to uh, introduce the first shipyard, Armour Yachts. Yes. Please, Barbara Amelio. Uh, thanks uh, to Fabio Butturi uh, by Diesel International for the invitation. I'm happy to be here with you uh, all uh, celebrating the Earth Day during a sustainable uh, um, powertrain event. Uh, what is the sustainability for Amariot? I think it's a matter of saving. When I was a child and my father at home teach me to save water for brushing my teeth, I have learned fast that mine was a family with a no waste philosophy. This no waste concept adapted to a yachting building team means working for saving water, electricity, weight, and this will permit our clients to save fuel emission and money too. Concerning the boat building, fiberglass composite was a huge invention, a long life product for lasting 60, 70 years, but now is becoming a problem for the future generation at the end of the boat life. Our sustainable proposal is starting reducing traditional composite and for all the interior material, also the hidden ones, they have to be chosen involving the supplier and be replaced where is possible with their uh, eco version. So using bigger glass surfaces, stainless steel armors for the flybridge structure, external furniture in new eco material, we could reduce a ton of fiberglass composite. Or concerning weight saving, new generation isolation material eco-friendly, cork for the deck, filava composite for the component are all useful for a future dismantling process and for reducing the weight of the vessel. Our final focus will be increasing filava composite and bioresin uh, use till replacing a told GRP and producing a new cradle to cradle yacht. Regarding our evolution, the perfect example is the Hammer 94 Twin, called the boat of record, powered Volvo Penta IPS 1350. Uh, with this boat, we have reduced uh, 20 tons of weight and uh, with only 5,000 uh, gasoil tanks capacity, uh, we have uh, um, permitted to show uh, till 45 consumption reduction comparative to a similar yacht with traditional powertrain. 
the Hammer 94 is able to make a non-stop navigation at the nine knot uh, from Venice to Monaco and more with only three liters for mile consumption uh, with uh, two engines and a generator on reaching also a top speed at the 27 knot and the cruise speed at the 23 knots uh, with uh, 300 liters in total of consumption. It's amazing. This experience is inspiring all our new models. Regarding the future, uh, now we are call, uh, all called to reduce uh, NOx and becoming uh, CO neutral uh, within uh, 2050. Uh, depending on the acceleration of the research, we are in the middle of a river. Strict rule, rules on the one side and hydrogen too far to be massive distributed at the sea. In this moment, my company is working on a twin hybrid powertrain studied for the 100 able to reach about 80 knots speed maximum using fewer or new fuel with uh, two uh, Volvo Penta and uh, two electric engines. Uh, um, the power is uh, 730 for the, uh, for the engine and uh, uh, 160 kilowatt for the electric engines. This version will permit to use a separate way uh, thermic or electric propulsion. There will be space enough to install also two Volvo Penta SCR to re reduce NOx emission. And as we have done with the acoustic emission analysis studied by Setena and gifted to Volvo Penta, we would like to produce an history case boat to analyze uh, for the SCR effective effect on board by sensor created for this and installed to have back cruising navigation data at the disposal of Volvo Penta. This new hybrid layout will be available from uh, 2023. But in these days, we have met the Volvo Penta team to organize a new schedule for an amazing project available for 2024, where they will be able to supply a very interesting uh, kit, uh, included uh, non, not only in the powertrain, uh, thermic engines and electrical ones, but also the generators, the variable phases generators, batteries package. This will permit a very flexible system for our range of uh, yacht. And in this case, the thermic power will be added to the electrical one to boost the speed. All will be integrated in, and in this mean that one company supplier and one company guarantee. Last focus news is concerning the easy boating. A new easy docking system by Volvo Penta will be available in a short time. And we are delighted to announce here that this innovative system will be on board on the new Hammer 120 and ready to be tested during the next bull show. Speaking about the new uh, research and development, we are working on a twin project with a research and biologists a whale watching vessel created for 60 passengers in electric propulsion with a six hour autonomy and um, will be powered by two uh, generators, a battery package and uh, deep speed new electric engines that uh, will be available in uh, 2022. And a second whale watching vessel evolution will be projected with hydrogen fuel cell available for 2024. Thank you for your attention and I wish you all uh, to enjoy the sea for some time. Okay, thank you, Barbara Merio. Thank you because you help us to have a to embrace a user horizon about the world sustainability. So that is not just limited on propulsion, on propulsion systems. Thank you for the, for the previews as well. We will wait in, in a couple of years, you know, what just you, you mentioned about.
So now the protagonist in the engine room have access to the floor, finally. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Gregorio Passani missing from uh, Nanny and the Jim Blues because of uh, an, an emergency occurred a few minutes before, before, before the start of the event. So the words to Mr. Massimo Labruna for first and Mr. Tobias Cole just in alphabet alphabetical order. So AS before and after Rolls-Royce power system. Five minutes. Like, oh, something more if you want. Please, Massimo. Hi, hi to everybody. Thanks, uh, Fabio, and thanks, Diesel International, for the this is uh, uh, this uh, extra extraordinary opportunity uh, to speak uh, um, on uh, hybrid propulsion and on uh, sustainability because uh, my company and I, I am very closer to this, uh, to this matter. Sustainability is a word that has been very overused in recent times. The right approach to this matter is to open our mind and to see the question from the different points of view. Sustainability involves a lot of aspects on recreational boating. Water itself is changed by the presence of boats. Studies on water quality and quality found that the presence of vessel due to chemicals that are used to clean, protect and run watercraft and that are often leached into the water, severely impacting the environment and weakening or killing the wildlife. Toxins from detergents paints, petroleum products, batteries, and metals have disastrous effects on wildlife ability to survive and thrive. A European team of, of consultants recently published the report on the environmental impacts of recreational nautical activities. They indicate that the main impacts are of seven types. Three of these are strictly connected to engine room. The first, hydrocarbon releases and other substances that are released into the environment by the engines of recreational craft. Oil and bilge water generated from unburned or incompletely burnt fuel, particulates, and trace of oil are released into the environment by the engines. There is also noise disturbance. At first, in accordance with the standards, the authorized level of noise emitted by new engines has been limited since 2006. However, when the boats operated at speed, at speed close to the shore, Angie's noise uh, is perceived as nuisance in sensitive areas, such as beaches of natural protected areas. We have so three enemies to combat for sustainability. We have gas emissions and we have NOx particulate and carbon dioxide. We have also oil and fuel leakage and sound emissions. Diver solution formed by the internal combustion engines and battery pack is a solution to combat these enemies. And today it is the best solution in terms of safety because there is a redundancy, reliability and cost, even if today are very high. And we have also low emission during use, but it is a real solution for sustainability. I think no, because battery packs are produced with no renewable energy sources. And so their production cycle involves a great production of carbon dioxide. This is also the problem for hydrogen fuel cells. We must consider also polluting processes by which naturally occurring materials are extracted and used for batteries. 
In the end of uh, 2020, Akio Toyuda, the Toyota's number one and president of the Japan Automobile Man Manufacturers Association, and also the chairman of the Bosch Superv Supervisory Board, clearly expressed this concept about electric cars. The, the problem is that when we use a board in electric mode, we are really cruising at zero emission and we are not destroying the environment, but we have just damaged it before. So we are telling a great lie to the people. The paradox is that a new recreational boat without, with hybrid propulsion, with a battery pack, has already polluted like a poor boat with a, an internal combustion engine, with a diesel engine that has been sailing for three years. If we want sustainability, it is mandatory to see the full life cycle of recreational board. So my answer to your question is that sustainability on recreational board implies great attention to all life cycle, not only focused on daily use. Today, the solution of hybrid propulsion with a diesel engine and battery pack is the best solution but it's not a sustainable solution. It is only a transition solution. And we must fix this concept because we must see all the life cycle. Thanks. Hey, please, Mr. Cole. Yeah, the, uh, good afternoon and also good morning. I've seen in the audience that there's also people joining from the US. And first, thank you very much for the possibility to join uh, the session here. Um, first, before we start, um, some words to the company. You can see two logos uh, on, on my background. You see Rolls-Royce and even MTU, just as a short explanation Who, for people who do not know exactly what relationship is. MTU is the brand of, of the engine and Rolls-Royce power system is the company I'm working for. And we are in the under umbrella of the Rolls-Royce PLC organization. Um, today, we like to focus on, um, let's say, the propulsion side of, of the business. Uh, you can find traditionally our uh, engines in uh, several uh, different uh, areas of uh, applications. Uh, it's not only limited to the marine industry, it's also to uh, land-based applications in mining, stationary power plants, and uh, trains, for example. Um, what I've like to mention is many, many important things have been mentioned already in the discussion so far. And uh, sustainability is, is a very wide topic. And I very much like the holistic approach, which was, uh, let's say, bring on the point. Uh, we, it's not uh, possible that we focus on a single thing. We have to uh, see the whole process from the early end uh, to uh, from the beginning to the end. Um, if we think a second about, about the sustainability, um, there is a definition, and we touched this also, we have the 17 UN goals, which can use this orientation for that year. Um, and uh, it has to be considered that we have also social, environmental, and economical aspects to take under consideration. Back to the propulsion system. Um, Today, we have simply to recognize that we are mainly consuming fossil energy resources today, which is uh, the biggest challenge. Because here, we, re we need to uh, question our behavior and rethink our today's uh, technology concepts. And that's, that's the big uh, uh, chance, but also all the challenge for us. Uh, we need to come to the point where our resources are used in a way that we can keep the natural regenerative capacity of the environment, especially of living beings and ecosystems. And this means mainly if we focus on propulsion engines, the decarbonization of our approach, so the reduction of CO2 mainly. That sounds simple in a first step, uh, but we have to recognize that this today is very attractive and easy to handle. You can uh, take diesel fuel without any special requirements, at least if you compare it to other alternative sources, you can bunker it, you don't have to pressurize it, you don't have to clean it. Um, 
um, and it can fill somewhere where space is uh, available as bunker tanks. The most important thing is that we really try to improve as an industry and offer solutions, uh, not only in a long-term range. For sure, there are attractive um, technologies, methanol, e-methanol, for example, fuel cells, methanol engines, ammonia, and uh, all the, the complete uh, uh, power to liquid or power to X approach. Uh, the question also, uh, and we have to go down this path for sure, and we as a company are investing quite a lot in, in these technologies. We have all of them on, of them on the radar. But one of the most important thing is that we uh, think about what can we do today? What can we do with the installations on board we have? And how, how can we bring them to a, uh, let's say, more attractive way of usage? For sure, one of the topics we like to discuss today, today is um, the hybrid uh, solutions. But even if we don't have the chance for hybrid solutions, there are other ways. At Rolls-Royce Power Systems, we established the Green and High-Tech program. Um, and this Green and High-Tech program uh, consists of uh, different development areas. One of them is the exhaust gas after treatment system to reduce the emissions. Another one is the intelligent, intelligent usage of, of the engines. We heard about that. How can we bring diesel engines from part load more to a, uh, let's say, a, a good utilization grade point of view? And how can we uh, use digital data, data uh, as, a, as a sum to bring the engines and installations to a very attractive area of fuel consumption, for example? Hybrids we touched. Alternative fuels, very important, such as biofuels, synthetic fuels, or um, other alternatives, as I mentioned already, power to X. In future, we will see for a long time the coexistence of different, um, let's say, uh, propulsion solutions, and the diesel will be with us for a couple of years. Also, we use, uh, but we need to have a good uh, development on that. We need to go in the right direction and follow this decarbonization approach. Um, with that, I would like to end my introduction with saying there is no black and white. We have to um, work with the things we have today. We have to continue the development on the new energy-based uh, propulsion solutions, but we cannot so, so lightly think about new installations. We also have to focus on the boats and the installations we have today in the field. And here we can do many, many improvements on the long way to a greener environment and um, carbon-free uh, carbon uh, propulsion. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, both of you, because you created a very interesting uh, storytelling. I mean, our panel is made by a solution provider who faces all the Mediterranean basin uh, from one of the leaders, you know, I mean, um, the first one is AES La Bruna, the second one, Rolls-Royce Power System, well known as NTU, uh, that, you know, is, is a leader in over 80 feet uh, recreational boats. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's um, hear another illustrious case study that of Fincantieri Yachts. In this case, we turn to the mega and giga yacht segment, Mr. Jacopo Molinari. Okay, thank you for your time. So my name is Jacopo Molinari and I'm a proposal engineer at Fincantieri Yachts. On top of that, uh, I also represent my company at SEBAS, uh, which is a Super Yacht Builders Association in the Sustainability Committee. So uh, without further ado, let me just show you a little presentation I prepared for today. Okay. So my presentation will focus on a case study for a possible yacht. Uh, in this case, I mean uh, quite a large yacht, so something above uh, 70, 80 meters length. First of all, a couple of words on uh, what sustainability is. As uh, Fabio was uh, telling at the beginning, many people have uh, different meanings for sustainability. In our vision, sustainability means having three pillars, which are the environmental one, 
it is uh, environmental, earth, the oceans, the social one, that is respect for the people, and the economic one, of course, which is uh, that any activity must be profitable, otherwise it will be unsustainable. All these three pillars must coexist in order for an activity to be sustainable. So if you're gonna take out even only one of those pillars, then the activity as a whole will no longer be sustainable. Moving forward, uh, as I told you, my presentation will focus on uh, power train, so that is propulsion and power generation. So here is a, a little history on uh, power on board vessels. We started with sails. After that, we moved to coal. And uh, to give you an example, coal steamers immediately made sail clippers obsolete and unsustainable from the economic point of view. Because back then, coal was uh, more reliable, faster. And so sail clippers were no longer sustainable because they were lacking one of those pillars. From coal, we moved to diesel vessels. In the 60s, 70s, we also had a short spin-off with nuclear-powered vessels, but uh, in the end, this evolution branch led to nowhere, and uh, today there is only a handful of uh, nuclear-powered vessels, mainly icebreakers. And now we are here, just after the diesel, but before the future. In the immediate future, we can see the dual fuel vessels. And uh, this is a X vintage, a 99 meter uh, concept that my company has designed, which is powered by dual fuel engines, that is uh, diesel oil and uh, natural gas. While for the future, for the farther future, many options will be available. One of those might be hydrogen and fuel cells. Fact is that these two type of vessels, the two concepts on the bottom of the slide, are in the future. But now we are here with diesel engines. And as everybody has said before me, we have to do something now. We cannot wait for the future to act. Speaking about fuels, we have seen that the present and the near future fuels are diesel oil, natural gas, LNG, and hydrogen. So uh, I just wanted to make a quick comparison of the mass and volume impact for the same quantity of energy coming from uh, these three fuels. In terms of mass, uh, using diesel oil brings the most weight. Hydrogen is very light for the same quantity of energy. Whilst for the volume, it is the exact opposite. Diesel oil is uh, very dense in terms of energy per unit of volume, while hydrogen takes a lot of space. On top of that, for diesel oil, we have a kind of free arrangement on board. We can feed it in double bottom tanks, while the two other fuels, the future fuels, have arrangement restrictions. They cannot be put everywhere in the boat. And also, there's the matter of the containment vessels to store those fuels. They are not liquid or not liquid at ambient temperature and has to be kept under pressurized or cryogenic temperatures with all the clearance and the safety aspects they bring. It's important to note that uh, on current mega yacht design, it's the space, the most critical aspect. So uh, in this slide, diesel oil will still be considered as the most convenient fuel today. Now, moving to a diesel engine. Mm, this is the engine chart, the power and speed characteristics. And here the various colored shaded curves are referred, are referred to the specific fuel oil consumption where green areas are where the engine works at its best, highest efficiency. And the, the further they move away, the worse the efficiency is. Traditionally for a propulsion engine, my operational conditions move along the 
propeller cubic curve. So the, like this red dot. What can I do to improve the working point of uh, a diesel engine? I can have uh, various type of hybridization. The first one would be to add the shaft generator, which will move the actual load seen by my engine up to a better working, up, working position, like the green dot here, which brings an improvement in specific fuel consumption. And so I can get more for the same uh, uh, fuel consumption, or to get the same, I just spend less fuel. Another option is to use the same shaft generator of the first option, also as a booster motor, so I can just uh, reduce the total power of the installed diesel engine. This is very important because uh, usually mega yachts are designed with high top speed, which are almost never used. Maybe it's 1% uh, of the lifetime of a yacht. So I have these big diesel engines, which are oversized to the, compared to the actual everyday use of the yacht. By using a booster motor to cut the engine power, I can install a smaller engine, which is more suitable for the actual use of the yacht. And so it will be more efficient for the intended use. Another hybridization option is uh, the installation of battery system, or in any case, an energy storage system. So let's consider this chart that um, shows the average load in percentage of the diesel generators against time. Usually, the load might be varying like this. So it's uh, very hysteric with a lot of variations. And uh, it may happen that sometimes the load has a sudden drop. And so below the bottom dashed line, one diesel, generation, one diesel generator will be called offline, if only to be brought back online a few minutes um, after that. And maybe due to a sudden spike, another diesel generator will be brought online only for a few minutes and then switched off again. By installing an energy storage system acting as a peak shaving system, I can have a smooth operation of this genset. So the gensets will work at an even load and the batteries will compensate these spikes by discharging and recharging. And in general, it is also possible that if the gensets layout and the battery power are studied properly, that I am avoiding to bring online and offline and continuously more gensets. This, of course, means also that the genset will work better and so will be more efficient. What the slide before showed is how to operate a hybrid configuration. But to go to move further, we can do something that uh, on a larger vessel, like our cruise vessels, is uh, usually done uh, on all projects. While in the yacht market is something that is still uh, primordial, not so um, widespread. Let's consider a uh, heat and energy balance of a genset. So we put some fuel in the genset, and let's say that this fuel has 100% of the energy. This is a generator, and so we are producing electrical power, let's say 36%. These numbers, of course, are variable depending on the engine model, engine maker, so let's consider them as a magnitude, not as a strict numbers. Of this 100% of the fuel, then, about 4% is lost as an alternative efficiency. About 28% are lost as hot exhaust gases. About 30% are lost in the cooling loops of the engine, both low temperature and high temperature, if two loops are available, or 30% in a single loop and then about 2% in thermal radiation inside the engine room. Now, 
what is uh, worth noting is that uh, both the exhaust gases and the high temperature cooling loop have very high quality heat. That is heat which is available at high temperature. So just putting this heat in seawater or in the air is a waste of potential energy that could be recovered somehow by heat exchanger or uh, exhaust heat boilers. Let's say that uh, we can recover the full high temperature loop and part of the exhaust and get 20% of the original 100%, which instead of being wasted, can be used for two main purposes. The first one is direct heating of something that could be on a yacht, pool water, or the sanitary water system, or used in the HVAC system in, during winter months. A second option is to use this heat in a, an organic ranking cycle unit, that is a, a small unit that uses a steam cycle with a fluid which is not water, but is a, an organic fluid which has a much lower boiling point. And uh, this unit uh, is used to produce more electric power. Now, these units do not have a very high efficiency because the temperatures are not extreme as in a full-fledged steam turbine arrangement. But uh, even if uh, the efficiency was only 10%, then it is uh, something that can be added to the electrical power production, raising this 36% overall efficiency of the system to about 38, 39. So it is something that is worth considering. These are the things that we can do now. It is almost clear that in the future we will be moving to something else, but uh, we will get to the future step by step by doing a lot of uh, smaller steps today, which all coupled can be can lead us to the future, I guess. Okay. The Thank you, Mr. Molinari. I uh, confess to you, I confess to you, we have some <laughs> problem. Oh, we still. Okay. I have one more thing. Okay. As a builder, ah. if I have to choose uh, an engine, my shopping list uh, will be, I'm, I'm taking the chance to say this because we also have uh, engine makers. My shopping list would be to have two items. First one is more exhaust back pressure because on the exhaust line, I already have to install selective catalytic reduction equipment. The diesel particulate filtering equipment, which is something that all yacht users want. The silencers, of course, and then the exhaust line itself. Now, if I also have to install an exhaust gas boiler, I will need a lot of back pressure available not to choke the engine. The second item is uh, uh, split cooling loops for the high temperature and low temperature uh, loops because only the high temperature loop is useful for heat recovery. Mixing it with the low temperature would kind of impair this uh, functionality. Okay, now I'm done. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Borinari, thank you. I confess to you, you probably read in our mind because at the beginning, we thought to organize this event in three different steps, answering the following questions. What about today? What about tomorrow? And what about the day after tomorrow? And we, 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 we thought about three different topics, diesel, LNG, and hydrogen. So <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. Well, and now it's time to return to the engine room. May we, um, may we ask Mr. Cole and Mr. Labruna to describe a case study and applica an application or our concept, please? Well, if uh, I can start, if I may. So um, first, thank you very much, Jacobo, for this uh, uh, presentation, because at least it covers already 
some of very important measures we can take under consideration and which you also can use as a case study here. So uh, you mentioned that waste heat recovery systems uh, can help to bring the diesel engine in areas where it's more attractive um, be, uh, um, in regards to the, um, let's say, the energy which is no longer wasted and used for, for other purposes like hot water or cooling, uh, not cooling, heating the boat, or at least also have the possibility to simply avoid, uh, yeah, the waste of this energy. This is uh, this is great, and we can have two possibilities, as you mentioned correctly here. One is to take the heat off out of the exhaust, and the other one is to take the heat out of the cooling circuit of the engine. And uh, if I have a short look to your uh, shopping list, uh, I think we should talk to each other after this call because there are many, many things which we can already fulfill with our newest, newest products we have already. Uh, another very important point is, um, again, I mentioned this also during the first session, bring the engine in an area where the fuel consumption is, is very attractive. And uh, we have, have heard right now that um, that the engines are very, very often uh, used in part load. Uh, the generators on board because of redundancy issues. So we, I can confirm that uh, if we have a look to the load balances of the generators, we very often recognize that we have two generators running uh, in part load uh, just because of redundancy issues. And uh, normally one generator would, would uh, um, be enough Batteries for sure is, is something which can help us here, but not in the way saying we want to have batteries on board to sail for a certain while. So Lilium batteries, uh, the batteries just as a redundancy factor and as a peak shaving um, utility here. Another point is, um, especially if we have lots of areas of part load, we also can run with the variable speed gensets and a variable speed genset is very attractive because here I, I can adjust the operating point of the engine to an area where really the power is related to the RPM and not, let's say, run the engines on a stable 16 or 1800 RPM range or 15 or 1800 RPM range here to get the 50 or 60 Hertz. Um, this can be achieved with uh, modern intelligent, let's say, uh, digital solutions where we can have uh, also on existing boats to um, analyze the load profiles and uh, give an advice to also the shipyards or the uh, operator of the boat how to bring that in a, in a more attractive area of, of fuel consumption. Um, another thing what was mentioned is, is the downsizing idea, which is also something uh, which we have to take under consideration, um, especially in the combination of hybrid installations. Uh, it was mentioned that most of the time the yachts see the operating point not under full load, just under part load again, and very, very seldom on the high power range. And there, um, a downsizing could be a good idea. And in the case, if the owner wants to have a full speed, then this can be additional power, which the energy is coming out of a battery and electrical motor. That's, that's another possibility. Um, important is that we have to recognize somehow that, and we have seen that quite impressive on, on the slide before, that the installations are becoming more complex. We have to take under consideration uh, additional components. For sure, this is not applicable for every size of boat. So the studies we did with, with uh, different customers in the UK, but also in Italy and the US, we found out that for sure spaces and weight is one of the most interesting things. And uh, it is, let's say, very often given that we have to focus on the one or the other measure. Nevertheless, um, to summarize that, um, we have also to take into consideration that the installations or the com more complex installations have to be tested in advance, have to bring together to a system. So because um, with a certain complexity, we have to also pre-test this and uh, make a qualification out of it to make it easy to handle for the owner and board, because again, this was said also at the beginning of the session is uh, we have to fulfill the requirements of the customer. So it has to be in a good balance between the measures we can take and also 
uh, the technical possibilities we can have from a Solili engineering point of view. Okay, thank you. Massimo, Mr. Lebruna. Yes, okay. I speak now about some application and uh, I start uh, because I guess Labruna is very cost focused on blue economy. We start to research and develop a low impact propulsion solution from 2010 with uh, our hydropack hybrid version for uh, two passenger boat for Asinara Park. In these years, we have uh, explored various solutions in our role of uh, in our role of system integrator. We have realized that today the best solution is hybrid solution for long range cruising boat and work boat and full electric solution for coastal cruising recreational boat. Internal combustion engine is not substitutable for deep sea cruising. The boats require safety with every weather condition and safety needs power. If the power needed from both increases, the dimensions and the weight of full electric propulsion is not sustainable. If the mission is low autonomy and low power, full electric propulsion can be a good choice. We have found a very professional partner in uh, CMV with blue hybrid system for hybrid propulsion. At the same time, we are studying and producing full electric and fuel cell solution and mixed oleodynamic electric solution with hydropack. With CMV, we are starting a research project on power management system for hybrid propulsion with the aim to build the standard kit for hybridization of propulsion. In the next watch show in Venice, we present our e-power division a business unit totally dedicated to sustainability propulsion with hybrid propulsion and inboard submergible and outboard full electric solution. I want to speak uh, uh, about a recent work. This is not a recreational boat, but is the first hybrid patrol boat of Italian Guardia di Finanza operating in Venice intended for the surveillance of the lagoon and of the urban area. It is one of the first crafts with the low environmental footprint of the armed forces. Eight meter length and uh, it is equipped with a CMD blue hydro propulsion with an FNM diesel engine of 240 kilowatt and electric motor with a power of 25 kilowatt. On board, there are a battery pack of 35 kilowatt per hour of energy that gives five hours of autonomy. This propulsion will allow patrolling both in high seas with a speed either there than 35 knots and in the very delicate lagoon areas at a speed of over five knots with zero emission. When the diesel engine is used, the battery pack is recharged. There is also the possibility to recharge battery from lane sources. This flexibility allows to protect the environment when the, it is used of an ecosystem as special as the Venetian Lagoon without compromising on efficiency in terms of speed and oper operational capabilities and reliability. This is the perfect explanation of how the hybrid solution now today is the best, is the best, because it is a right now a valuable technology that assures partial sustainability, but very good performance. I have also a, a video of this board. If we have time, I can share my video. Yes, yes. We got I, it sometimes I, more. Yeah, please, Mr. Rune. We are sharing, I'm sharing.
we no. don't see it. We, we don't see anything. Okay. okay. Now we can watch it. Lunga 8 metri, larga 2,45 e alta 1,80 per passare sotto i ponti del centro storico anche con l'alta marea. Ma la nuova moto pesante è soprattutto. Ok. Does it work? Is it ok? Yes. <laughs> Just Now because. In this boat. We okay. have uh, also uh, studying other applications because we are also a FPT industrial uh, distributor and today we are enlarging, enlarging our application also to F FPT marine engines because uh, we, we want to have a complete range of hybrid solution from uh, 40 uh, kilowatts to uh, 1000 uh, horsepower and so we are uh, we are very involved on, on uh, the study of uh, various application thanks okay thank you okay thank you it was a privilege and an honor to gather the entire yachting industry as well as hear from real world experts um, we need to uh, we need genuine responses and not slogans Now it's time for questions from the audience. The first is addressed to Icomia, Armor Yachts and Ficanteri Yachts. Do you believe it is appropriate to include incentives for yachts, hybridization and electrification? In your opinion, what other marine application in addition to yacht may benefit from such incentives? Mr. Claims and Mr. Plain, please. I, I can probably help answer that. Sorry, Mr. Klenitz has had to just drop out with a with another call. But Hi, Mr. I, I think there are, there are a number of uh, incentives that can be made available. And I think Richard Payne touched touched on a few. If if we are going to head um, in in a specific technology uh, type or fuel type, whether it is electrification or, or hydrogen. We do need to make sure that the, uh, you know, the safety measures, the standards, um, those kind of things surrounding the technology are, are in place. Um, and I think there, there's a lot, it's quite a small industry. Um, so it's not like uh, comparable to the motor car industry to, to the mass transport sector. So I think the more we can do to help um, smaller engine manufacturers, smaller engine boat builders, uh, to encourage them to choose and, and try new technology types, the better. So, okay. Did you, did you finish? Did you finish the time? Thank you. So I think ladies first. So Mrs. is are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> yes, uh, could help some incentive to uh, to uh, help uh, shipyard uh, to find a new solution. Uh, there is uh, also another solution that can be work on the white certificate that are already used in the commercial and uh, can be also. Uh, bring uh, in the pleasure uh, yachting. Um, this uh, can can be an idea. Okay, thank you. Last but not least, Ms. Molinari from Fincantieri Yacht. Okay, my opinion is that uh, incentives are good, but I would not stick them only to hybridization. I would rather focus them uh, on the final effect. So, um, like a uh, Define a baseline of uh, emissions, 
and then if you are below this baseline, you get an incentive. However, you achieve this result. So be that by herbalization, be that by after treatment of the exhaust, be that by using novel technologies, but I would not stick to a specific technology. I will leave the shipbuilder open to any possible solution. Uh, the difference be between ships and mainly yachts and the um, road market is that uh, cars are built uh, in a uh, huge numbers of limited models while yachts are usually custom built so it is hard to define a specific incentive for a specific technology it's easier in this case to certify the final results okay okay many thanks to all of you the second question is does it make sense in your point of view that in a decade you can imagine so just to suggest to you so the yacht the yachting industry would bypass the electrification process and moving forward to hydrogen so mr labruna and mr uh, cole please uh, take you maybe some minutes more if you want so if we have enough time so it's up to you please mr labruna can you hear me Thank you. Thank you, okay. Fabio. I, I make some premises. We have a, a particular vision of the future. Electrification with battery packs uh, is not future because if we consider, like I say before, the building process, the recharge of batteries and considering that electricity generating in industry is the major contributor to atmospheric pollution, and also the dismission of battery, the use of battery is very impacting on pollution. Electrification with, with fuel cell, with hydrogen, it could be future in less than 10 years. But we must consider that today hydrogen is produced with a large amount of carbon di di dioxide. So the technology of hydrogen fuel cell is uh, also a right now technology, but we have two problems. Um, hydrogen is uh, a dangerous, um, and uh, we have also a, a problem to put tanks in the boat. And uh, also the production of hydrogen uh, is with a large amount of carbon dioxide. So we have the same problem of the battery. When we use hydrogen, we not impact on the environment, but in the production of the hydrogen, we have a great impact to the, to the environment. So if you want to respect the environment, we must work on land activities to produce hydrogen from renewable ener energetic sources. This is the real challenge. Hydrogen is an, an actual developed technology, but not in line with the concept of sustainability. We had made a strategic, strategic choice and uh, we are involved in a, a particular project. Diesel engines today have a very low emission of uh, NOx and particulate, thanks to selective catalytic reduction and antiparticulate filters. The problem is carbon dioxide. We are studying to use dioxide to produce methanol and use methanol in a fuel cell. Methanol can be used also in internal combustion engines. So we store energy in methanol tank and, non in, and not in a battery pack or in high pressure hydrogen tank. This technology already exists, but not in mobile applica application. So we are involved to um, transform this technology and uh, in mobile for mobile application. In a simple way, when we use diesel engine, we have a very low pollution and not produce carbon dioxide, but methanol. In particular, protected area, 
we can use methanol in a fuel cell to produce electricity to power electric propulsion. The efficiency now is not high, uh, but we are studying on this. This is our vision of the future, because a hybrid system with the diesel electric motors and uh, methanol fuel cells. Because uh, we know we not only think different, but uh, also we act different. We are uh, we want to change the paradigm of, uh, of the propulsion on board. We are uh, seeing all the life cycle of the the board to be closer to the concept of sustainability. So okay. Thank you, Mr. Lebruna. And Mr. Cole, please take your time. If you need uh, some minutes more to explain some additional points of view, so take some minutes more, feel, uh, feel free to do it. You know, we have, we have enough time. You are the, the, the happy final ending of this event. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> so coming back to the question, does it make sense that uh, in a decade, the auto industry would bypass electrification and go straight to hydrogen? I would say uh, the key for future propulsion and energy on board is electrification at all. The big question is where does the energy come from? And um, it is true that at the moment um, we have to have some challenges to get, let's say, really the green uh, fuels for this. And um, we have to talk about the E um, approach, so that the, the let's say the, the approach to use um, energy where we have enough from it. So, for example, from wind farms, use that energy to produce hydrogen. That's that's a very important thing. So, um, the end-to-end -end approach in the end. That's that's something we really like to point out. Um, yeah, for sure we have, uh, and hydrogen, by the way, is one of the, um, let's say, the basis for all power to X fuels. And um, so we, we can discuss possibilities to go for uh, ammonia, methanol, LNG. So, or uh, also the e diesel approach is important that we all the time use resources, electricity, which is from the renewable energy sources like wind farms, solar, et cetera, PP. So I can fully agree to what was stated before. Uh, we have to um, utilize also the land-based uh, um, plants we, we have um, uh, at the moment of which we need to develop further. Um, at the moment, from my perspective, we are in the middle of an orientation phase. Electricity um, or electrification is, is, let's say, the, the propulsion in the end. So if we have an electrical motor, if we have a combustion engine, I think we see also the trend that in, in regards to um, uh, these electric boats, because here I have much more flexibility. And um, so in the end, if we go down this path with the electrification um, of, of the boats, the question is, what, what kind of sources do we have? Today, we have diesels to drive a generator. In the future, we will have fuel cells or we have uh, methanol uh, driven fuel cells with a reformer technology, or we have methanol engines, or we also have to think if ammonia could be an alternative in, in this regards. So uh, to, to answer that quite, uh, question directly, so electrification is, is I say, the prime path for propulsion energy resource, uh, energy uh, creation on board. And the question is then, what kind of technology we use in, in a first uh, step? Is it um, the fuel cell? Is it then the, the methanol reform technology or something else? Okay, thank you so much, because you respect perfectly our expectations. I mean, so Bruna projected us in a mixture between present and future, uh, talking about methanol and, uh, and the fuel cell. And Mr. Cole, so uh, reminded to us some pills of what I remind about a, a webinar. A webinar I attended to managed by Rosalys Power System was focused exactly on Power Two X. That in very interesting perspective in the medium, in the medium, uh, in short and medium term. And now it's time to thank the panelists as well as those of you who turned in remotely. 
Of course, the editors of Diesel International are to be thanked. The sustainable powertrain tour is still going strong. We'll meet again on July the 15th to discuss sustainability in cogeneration. I'd like to remind you that the video of the event will be available on the Diesel International YouTube account from tomorrow. Thanks again to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you around, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Thank you. Thank you to all of you.